Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Spirit, the Influence of Other Spirits. And it is part of the Spirit Relationships series. It was presented in London, UK on the 26th of February, 2012. This is session two, part two. Um, one thing I'd like to, or a couple of things I'd like to raise with you. Firstly, um, the amount of spirits with you currently that are trying to stop me from talking to you about them are quite intense. They're trying to close down my throat area of my speaking, and that's why I sort of am not as clear with my voice uh, as I would normally be. And uh, and obviously that still means I have an opening to be closed down, so I need to work my way through that. But that also indicates that there are many spirits that are with you that don't want you to hear much of the information regarding them regarding spirits themselves. And I would like to talk to you a little too about what kind of influences some of you are under with regard to spirits, in particular the sexual influences that you are, many of you are under. If a person on earth has um, some emotions regarding feeling uh, insecure sexually, feeling that they are looking for spirituality. In other words, they feel unspiritual and they're looking for a spirituality of some kind. And they also have some, um, what you would call sexual, probably sexual fears. <coughs> they might also feel... Um, unattractive and other things like that. Or they may feel the other opposite emotion in that they're very attractive. attractive. They're very attractive and they want people to validate that. And, and they believe also in uh, trying to become liberated. So in other words, inside of themselves, they probably don't feel liberated at all, but they want liberation. What happens is that many of these emotions are noticed by a group of very, very dark male spirits. And if that woman, that woman then is drawn to a man on earth who classifies himself as a guru in love, but actually what he's talking about is he's actually classifies himself as a guru in sex. These spirits are looking after this man and often experiencing sexual interactions with women through this man. So this man is going to encourage this woman using these hooks, using these, manipulating her emotions about those particular things, to engage sexually either with him or groups of other people, many other people. In the process, what happens to the woman is that she doesn't actually deal with any of these emotions. She, she, she is often in a facade of having dealt with these emotions. And instead, many of these emotions become worse for her. She, in other words, she feels even more insecure, less spiritual and so forth as she engages in these, in these things with the guy. I'll just uh, my, find my notes. So what uh, what happens is this man uses the terminology of spiritual development. without having any substance and influences these women, many of whom feel attractive because of these different emotions that they have, into th doing things like group sex and uh, sex with multiple partners and all of these other types of interactions sexually in order really 
The whole purpose of it is really the sexual gratification of those spirits. Does that make sense? Now, once you challenge this in the person, particularly in the guru, you will find the guru is actually a very angry person, a very angry man, generally, who, who, and these spirits are actually very angry men as well, whose only desire is to control large groups of, spirit, of, of women sexually because they can't engage sexually with, spirit, with women in the spirit world very easily where they are. And so what they're doing is they're trying to engage people on the earth sexually. That's an example of how a group of malevolent spirits spirits can actually, through the unhealed emotions of individuals, <coughs> create circumstances and situations that not only cause the degradation of the soul condition of the individual, but also the degradation of the soul condition of the so-called guru, but also continually cause the degradation of their own condition. Right? To suit their own addictions. Which is actually, in this case, an addiction to power. Not perceived power, but real power. Many people on earth um, become um, fooled by the perception of power. Do you, do you know what I mean by that? Like, so this woman is now feeling, she's been told by her guru that she's now liberated. She's been told by the guru that she's now got control of her life. But it's the illusion of power, because actually these spirits have control of her life. Do you understand? It's the illusion of power. Many people on earth are addicted to the illusion of power because they don't want to feel their real unpowerful or lack of powerful emotions, their lack, their lack of power. Many of you here have been influenced by such people, even in this way that I'm just speaking. Yes? in the past, and, and some of you still have been influenced in that manner. And, and it's a very dangerous uh, thing to be influenced by, because in the end, when you challenge the authority of these spirits, and you challenge the authority of this man, that's when you find out what's really going on. And then you'll realise that actually you've just fallen into a trap because of not wanting to feel some very hurt emotions from your own childhood. Jim? This is related. It's a question, though, about... Um, um, when In your talk about the definition of God, the world's definition of God. Yeah. So if one has taken an oath based on one's spiritual development and evolution... Mm -hmm. And it's kind of possibly tied up in a system like that, which is based on God, so swearing on God's laws that you will take the consequences if you break that oath. Is that defined by this unloving God? Or, it, I mean, it's tied so into these... So it's an oath? That yeah. If you can be more specific, what, what, do you mind telling the oath or are you not allowed to disclose that? I feel really uncomfortable <laughs> telling you that. I can tell you it's an oath to, of secrecy in order to not, not to reveal information, but it's taken on your health and on your spiritual evolution. Right. Would so, God ever yeah. agree to an oath of secrecy when the, when the Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth, which is a spirit of openness? And is, is it still possible for you to harvest the ill consequences of such an oath if that's not a God you believe in? Yes. Let's, let's show you what's really going on. Yeah. These spirits require the oath. And when you break the oath, those spirits will attack you. Do you understand? And they will threaten their attack of you initially, and when that doesn't work, they will actually attack you. And unless you patch up the holes inside of yourself that, that, are, that makes you open to the attack, you will feel it, even physically. Do you understand? The person who required the oath had nothing to do with God, and it's certainly not an oath God would accept anyway. And by the way, God does not accept oaths. 
can I point out? Because God knows that you're in a consistent change process and any oath would actually lock you up into not changing something. So God would not agree to such an oath anyway. So all oaths that are ever made towards God and threats that are provided if you break the oath are all about darker spirits who are attempting to manipulate and control. They have nothing to do with the God, the God that you believe you're connecting with. Um, yeah, it makes sense, but I just want to ask, and this relates a little bit to what I asked last time about if you say God's name and if you pray to God um, and you're not, you're not getting to God based on your addictions and your, you mm -hmm. know, the scenario that's taking place, mm -hmm. how, how can you reconcile with God the fact that you felt you were in some spiritual practice and you were praying to God really what you, in a way that you felt was incredibly earnest? And yet something that is taking place that is actually kind of uh, pretty shocking to perceive it from that perspective. Yes, I agree. The problem that we, this woman is facing, yeah. and you could put yourself in this position if you wish, the problem the woman faces is that she is not truthful with herself. She just believes she's truthful with herself. And there's a big difference between believing and actually being truthful with yourself. You see, if you're truthful with yourself, you would recognise your own insecurity. You would recognise your own feelings of a lack of spirituality. You would recognise your own feelings with regard to sexuality and these other emotions. And instead of feeding them as an addiction, you would choose to not feed them as an addiction and feel them instead. Now, and this is going to be hard for you to accept, I understand. This is the main problem that causes us to take these actions to get involved with such spirits, is our lack of desire to actually feel the emotions rather than have them as addictions. Do you understand? That is? Like, so what, in other words, the, the truthful state is, this woman that I've described here, has chosen to not feel those emotions. She's chosen to get from somebody else those emotions satisfied. And she has not been truthful with herself about that desire. Do you understand? She's been, she, she has not been truthful that the reality is that she feels all of those things. They're all the things she's trying to avoid. And she's not being honest about that that she's trying to avoid these terrible feelings. And it's the emotions that we attempt to avoid that allow spirits to process uh, and, and finish up taking over our life. So, so what we've got to do is come to terms with the fact, if we really want to process, progress, we've got to come to terms with all of the emotions we are attempting to avoid and, and see them for what they are, rather than engaging in a process that feeds them without us having to change inside of ourselves. Does that make sense to everyone? And what we often do, and, and I put to you that almost every single religious form that we have on this planet, right, feeds the addiction of somebody in some way. Right? So... If you look at, uh, for instance, if I look at Christianity as an, as, as, an, um, as an emotional experience rather than, than a religious one, what I see is this, there is this whole concept that somebody else died for my sins. That feeds my addiction to not be responsible for my own creation of my own sins. Can you see that? So by believing that somebody else died for my sins, I get away with sinning because I don't have to take personal responsibility for it. So the whole creation of that form of belief, which is a part of the Christian belief, I'm not saying all Christianity is false. What I'm saying is that particular belief in Christianity, which is false, is created by people's desire to avoid their own responsibility of their own actions. Now, if you look at every single belief system on earth, whether it be spiritual, so-called spiritual in nature, or other belief systems, 
you'll find there's always an emotional reason why a person would accept such a belief system. Now, what we've got to do is we've got to stop using belief systems as a way to avoid our life, and we've got to start using belief systems as a way to solve the issues in our life and actually embrace our life. And the problem is, on the planet today, there are very few, if any, belief systems that actually get you to embrace your life properly. I'm not saying embrace your errors. I mean embrace the truth of the condition, what's unloving, what isn't, what is truthful, what isn't, that kind of condition. And, and this is where we have a lot of problems on the earth today. On the earth, there is this deep desire in most of us to not feel truthful with ourselves and instead avoid <coughs> the real feelings we have by engaging in a religious or other form of practice that feeds those addictions instead. And this is how spirits control us. We want our addiction met. And a spirit going to look at that and go, yep, yeah, she wants her addiction met. I'm going to lead her to this person. He'll start meeting those addictions. Before she knows it, she's going to be in a process. And I'll get what I want from it too in the process. This is what the spirit believes. Of course, the spirit's harming the person, the woman, and also harming themselves and also harming the person that they've engaged as their emissary to do this thing. But none of those people want to know who's being harmed, and all of them want to avoid the truth of their real condition. In other words, most of us on the planet want to avoid looking at ourselves in the mirror and seeing what is really there. So while we have... so And what finishes up happening is we have a deep hurt and grief within us about wanting to find the truth, but at the same time, we have a deep desire to avoid our emotions. And this leads us to discover all sorts of things that are harmful to ourselves. This hurt and grief about truth causes us to go one spiritual thing after another spiritual thing after another spiritual thing, all around the world looking for resolution of that emotion. At the same time, I'm trying to look for resolution of avoiding the unhealed emotions that I have. And so I'll be attracted to anything that feeds these addictions. And that's the basic dynamic of almost every form of belief on the planet, including the, the tantric sexual beliefs. Yeah. So I'm not separating those beliefs from any other beliefs in terms of how they're created and how they are maintained. They are maintained and created by the same mechanism, just different emotions. Every, every one of them is created from a different emotion. Yeah. Is it possible then that se the sexual desire that you experience in that state is actually um, not your sexual desire at all? Not just possible. But that is the case. That is the case. So you actually have no true understanding. So what you feel is your own connection to... God. God. Is actually your own connection to one of these spirits masquerading himself as God who can play with your sexual organs in such a way through these unhealed emotions to heighten your sexual experience. So the spirit is heightening your sexual experience by manipulating your sexual organs while you're engaged in sexual activity physically. And you're open to the manipulation of it because of the different emotions that you have about, it, about what you're trying to achieve from the sex. And what most are trying to achieve from the sex is not sexual satisfaction necessarily, it's more connection with God is the idea. It's not a connection with God you are having because God has a sexual connection not with you but with the other half of herself. God has a connection with you in love and God designed you to have a sexual connection with the other half of yourself, your soulmate. That's what God designed. God did not design you to have a sexual connection with God. It is a fallacy to believe that God designed you to have a sexual connection with God. God designed you to have a sexual connection with your soul mate, and the sexual connection with your soul mate is what creates. Right? It's part of what creates. That's what God designed. But the spiritual gurus will tell you, right, who are doing this part, they say, no, no, it's a sexual connection with God. You're experiencing God. Why do they want you to believe that? 
because that will make you more open to the sexual connection experience, more open to the manipulation of the spirits who manipulate your sexual organs <laughs> to heighten your desires and so forth, and more open to giving them the sexual feelings that they want for gratification. So they can feed you a whole heap of untruth in order to meet their addictions. As I said, these spirits are very malevolent, very dangerous set of spirits who are masquerading as God sexually only for the purpose of their own gratification and ironically at the same time for the, they have huge amounts of hatred actually towards women and they like to see the degradation, the sexual degradation of women on earth and this is what they do. How does it feel, Judith? It's not feeling good at the moment. It's just really strong in my throat. Like, really... They don't want you to ask the questions. Yeah. yeah. Can you see why they don't want you to ask the questions? Yeah, because it's so massive. Well, it's also massive for them as well. You see? They have a vested interest in you not asking the questions. Do you understand? Their vested interest is not asking questions. They want this person to continue control they, through this process because every time you engage in sex in this manner, they connect with you. They love that. That's what they want to do, continue doing. Yeah. They don't want to give that up. They don't want you to believe what I'm saying at all. And it's up to you whether you believe it or not, but at least you're asking the questions. <laughs> But you can feel, even with the influence of your throat, how much they don't even want to have you open your mouth anymore about it. They don't, they don't want more truth to come out about the issue. Does that make sense? And yeah. That's, they have a strong vested interest in no more truth coming out. Yeah. No? Yeah, you had a... <coughs> I have lived this, as you know. Sorry, you... I have lived this, yes, of as course. you know. Yes, But uh, there's, I didn't avoid these feelings, insecurity, sexual fear. These are things that I went into from the experience of being with this particular person. No, you didn't. These are childhood feelings, and you never experienced them as a child. No. I, yeah, I experienced this. You experienced them as an adult by their treatment of you. Yeah. Which actually, can you see, it actually makes these even higher. That It actually creates even worse emotions within you. Totally. That's the irony of all yeah. of this, is that when you don't feel them in their causal manner, which is the childhood experience, so there, there's some insecurity coming from your childhood, yeah. there's some kind of stuff happening with your dad. Yeah. There's some, do you see? It's all yeah. related to something in your childhood. What, what these gurus encourage you to do is to not experience it at the childhood level, but rather to experience it in the situation they're engaged in. Yeah. It actually causes the degradation of the person, causes them to have even more shame. It makes them feel that they're even less spiritually developed. And as a result of that, they've got to do it even more to become more developed. Yeah. And so they get hooked into this cycle that, that becomes never-ending if they're not careful. But for most, it does end because yeah. eventually the feelings of this become so overpoweringly negative that you feel you have to disengage. Oh, God, yeah. And that's what happens. For yeah. most people, they disengage at some point in the future. But during that point in time, these spirits have had the use of you mm. for a long period of time. Mm. And, uh, and then they just go and find another woman with the same injuries and create the same dynamic, create the same thing, and then use them in the same manner. And these gurus go from one woman to the next woman to the next woman to the next woman, creating exactly the same thing. That's their pattern. And they are very deviant in their personality and nature. Mm. Uh, doing these things. They are not connected with God. They are not connected with God, in fact, in any way, except in the moments when they are repentant mm. for their actions, and some of them do feel quite repentant at times for their actions, but they're often heavily in the addiction with these spirits. Ironically, when these persons pass, they become one of those persons. Mm. Mm. And all they do is perpetrate the same thing with another male on earth, and off they go again with another group of women. Yeah. Can I have just two more questions? Fire away. Would I be right in chasing the thread of sexual projection from my dad? Yes. Right. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. All right, that's a good one. And <laughs> finally, 
Because remember, every one of these emotions that they're using as hooks has been in your childhood, in somehow present in your childhood, yeah. for you to be able to be used in this manner. So instead of condemning yourself for having these feelings, yeah. the key is to go into your childhood and examine where in your childhood these feelings existed right. and to feel about that in your childhood rather than feeling them as a grown woman. Mm. And mm. You're not actually releasing them. You're actually creating a heightened sense of those emotions as you go. So as you know through experience, your insecurity increased, not decreased. Oh, God, yeah. And you're, yeah. You know, the, do you understand? And yeah. this, is, this is what happens is that the insecurity increases, the feeling that you're not spiritual increases, mm. the feeling that you're unattractive increases. When, when the guru starts using other women other than you, then, then of course all of those things will increase. And then they go, see, see how yeah. unspiritual you are. I'm spiritual. I can go to any, you're not spiritual. I still love you even though, yeah. and it's all a lie. Yeah. It's all just a facade in order for these spirits that, to control. That is a massive grief I've got to get through. Yes. That is huge. Yes. One of the worst feelings for this person is always this feeling of being used. Mm -hmm. Coming to a recognition that I've been used sexually for the and my own unhealed emotions about spirituality and all sorts of things has been used by others in order to have power over me. Yeah. All the while I was thinking that I was the one with the power. Yeah. And it's just a false set of beliefs. And then finally, this particular person, yep. um, sh should he be in my life but at a distance? Or do you think there should be an absolute severing of even friendship? I never sever anyone from my life emotionally. I always, always pray for them. I always feel about them. I always love them and care about what they do. However, if they damaged me and wanted to continue to damage me, which in this case the person does, then I would certainly say to them, look, you're trying to damage me still. There's this dynamic going on and you're still trying to manipulate it. I don't want you in my life while you're trying to do that. When at some point in the future you feel sorry for those actions that you've taken, then I'm perfectly happy to re-engage you again, you know, if you're sorry for the, for the actions you've taken. But uh, if you're going to keep trying to have the same actions towards me and justify what you've done, I can't agree with that. Yeah? Now, of course, you know that this person, when you say that, gets into a rage. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Which is an indication of his true, spir oops, sorry, true spiritual condition. Yes. yes. The rage is an indication of how much he's in addiction with this whole thing. And, uh, and then you'll be able to see the true nature of the individual rather than seeing somebody who you believed him to be. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. And, uh, and this is the problem too, is that eventually such a person is exposed. The irony is, is a lot of people are opposed, well, well they feel uh, angry when I say I'm Jesus because they think that's what I'm trying to do with women. Right? The reality is nothing could be further from my mind. This girl is my only person, you know, and even if she's not with me, that's the only person I'll ever engage with. Right? So at the end of the day, definitely not doing the same thing as many of these men. But of course, there are many millions of these men on the planet. Uh, and many of them are claiming to be spiritual gurus. Many of them live in India, by the way, claiming to be spiritual gurus who have a long following of many women flocking to them. And see, many women are looking for spirituality, not satisfied with the spirituality that are being presented by the Western culture. They're looking for spirituality and, and then they get seduced by the other unhealed emotions into a form of spirituality, which is not spirituality at all, but actually interaction with spirits who are malevolent in the name of spirituality. That's the unfortunate truth about these things. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's good you girls have asked these questions. Very, very good questions. Um, so, as someone who's also lived something similar to this mm -hmm. uh, in my sleep state and in the first century, yes. Um, what I'm feeling about, if you can you just not that um, is I can write them down again. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have these emotions within us, this insecurity, this feeling, I'm not spiritual, I'm so shameful. Um, yeah, so I'm, shame is a definite emotion that, that yep. we want to add to that list. Yep. yep. A sense of being insecure as a woman, um, 
sexually uh, powerless. unsophisticated, powerless, all of these kinds of things. Yes. Um, not cool, not sophisticated, unsophisticated is a good one as well. Um, and what, what I was feeling about when Judith was asking her question was about, um, so she's taken an oath, or I gather, that people take oaths, let's just say it in the third person. Any oath to secrecy. Of secrecy. Always done by dark spirits because yep. they always want you to keep everything secret, what they're doing. But in that moment, the personal belief is I've, I'm taking this oath towards, towards God. Towards God. And they believe themselves to be God anyway, so... Exactly, and, and entering into these kind of um, situations where yeah. we believe the sexual energy is coming from God and so there's a big confusion about God. There's, yes. a, there's a feeling we're actually putting these spirits in the place of God in our life. Yes, there's a belief on the earth that sexual energy comes from God. God actually created sexual energy between, as a potential between soulmate halves. So while God created the whole idea or concept and laws involving sexual energy, sexual energy does not come from God, but rather from one half of the soul towards the other. So what I'm also feeling about as we're talking about the subject is all of those feelings that you had listed there, mm -hmm. I'm addicted to avoiding them. Yep. So I already have a fear of feeling them. Yes. And I take an oath even sometimes to these spirits who I become entrenched with. Yes. And then coupled with these emotions that I still have to fear, feel, yes. I now have a fear. And the fear is... Right. So the, right. Yeah, the fear that Judith expressed was, is this God going to punish me if I break the oath? Yeah. And I see that the truth is God won't punish me in fact, I feel that the only way I can come to closer to the arms of God is to now step into truth around all can of I this. Can I just... But... Yeah, go yeah, on. I was just saying, I need to say something while I remember. In front okay, of go. Said, is that all right? And I've got the same thing going on. Yeah, yeah, the, right. thought here. <laughs> the fear is not about the oath, is it? No, but well, this is my point. Yeah, yeah. This is my point, is so, that I'm, I'm afraid of God, my perception of God. But the fear is really, and the, I'm so emotional about this because I feel this fear within myself as well. Yep. My fear is of what these men are now going to do to me as I step into truth. So it's not really a fear of God either. It's actually a fear of... Of malevolent spirits that I've been entrenched with. Punishment. Punishment, yeah. And, and they're going to hit me with all of those feelings that I've been trying to avoid. Exactly. They're going to hit me with, you are shameful. I do have power. You are stupid. You are shameful. You are not sophisticated. You are not even safe right now. You're not You're, safe now. Yeah. We have got control of you now. They're going to hit you with all they've got. That's what's happening. Exactly. <laughs> to get you back under the control. And so, to me, it seems we, it requires quite a bit of courage now because we have got ourselves in a mess. We weren't humble in the first place. Yep, we didn't yep. want to feel those things. And now we're going to have to... Uh, be in a way, I can see that God's helping us with that process because to allow ourselves to be humble to the process because we're going to be hit with all those emotions <laughs> we're avoiding. Exactly. But um, yeah, so I kind of I was going Sorry. somewhere. Sorry. <laughs> but Where do you going? see what I'm saying? Um, just uh, the feeling was the only way I'm going to be closer to God is to step into truth and challenge this error state, yeah. but I feel like I'm going to be punished by God, yeah. really I'm going to be punished by people I've been entrenched with in a very negative way. Exactly. And so the only way I'm going to grow closer to God is to challenge and my is, oath. <laughs> and is to almost trust God that you will be safe by pulling your whole life into more harmony with truth. That's that's the end of my train of thought. Yeah. If I'm humble to what they're going to hit me with, I'm going to grow closer to God really rapidly. You are. Yeah. Even though it feels like the opposite. Even though it feels like you're just going to be overwhelmed with all this negativity, the reality is you'll grow towards God very rapidly mm -hmm. if you allow it all to occur and allow the attack to occur, but feel it as you go. So remember, this was all about the avoidance of feeling. So if you choose to feel it now, you have a great capacity to grow, right? Now, it's very important to understand, too, it's the fear of punishment that creates all those fear of the negative. Now, the only person that would ever threaten you with negative is a person in a very poor emotional and spiritual condition. Right? So God would never threaten you with something negative. 
happening to you. And uh, this is very important to understand about God. Now, why would I accept this? Because when I was a child, I was taught by my parents to accept punishment. They say, I'm smacking you right now because I, because I love you. Did it feel like that at the time? No. Definitely not. Right? And, but, but we accept punishment as an act of love, and now we accept these spirits masquerading as God wanting to punish us. And Judith, can I point out for yourself... There's a, I don't know if you've listened to it yet, but there's a talk that I gave quite a few months ago called um, Addiction, Bribery, Bribery, Bribery and threats. threats and Black Money. Yeah? Yeah? And I haven't listened to that again because they are, they are the tools these spirits are using. But see, can I just ask a question of, related to that? Yeah. The threat, the threat that I face right now is that I'm so naive in my understanding to take on your perspective. Now, it's less like a war going on. Right? Exactly. They're telling so you a... that you can't, they can't, they're saying to you at the moment, and I can yeah. hear what they're saying, they're saying, you can't trust him. You can't trust him. He's just feeding you a whole heap of bullshit Yeah, because now. you're just naive and you've yeah. taken in this thing and now you're taking in this and you haven't really strengthened yourself in any way and everyone's going to turn against you anyway, like physically, the people around you, once you... Once they witness this. Yeah. Can I suggest to you this? You can completely deny what I'm saying to you, and I am not going to turn against you. I'm still going to accept you, even if you attack me. I am not going to turn against you. The difference between myself and these spirits is they are definitely not going to do the same. The test of their true condition is how are they going to love you no matter what you choose to do? That's the test of love. So the real test of love, if you're in any situation where you're worried about who loves you, the real test of love is very simple, and it's this. If I do what I want, does the person still love me? person who loves you will love you no matter what you choose to do. And can you not stop Judith from feeling her feelings? Sorry, it just doesn't help her. She needs to connect with the feeling. I know you feel compassion for her, and I do too, but she needs to feel what she's feeling, yeah? And, uh, and allow yourself to feel what you're feeling too, the need to help her. She, she, she feels okay feeling her own feelings right at the moment, so... But understand, if I do what I want, what I want, does the person still love me? Now, a person who truly loves you will allow you to do all the things you want to do. If you choose to do things that damage them, they will continue to love you, but they might choose to not be with you while you do it. Does that make sense? But they will continue to love you. They will not abuse you. They will not be angry with you. They will not try to induce fear in you. They will not try to control you. They will not try to manipulate you in any way. Does that make sense? They will still love you no matter what you choose to do. Now, that kind of love is not the kind of love these spirits have. Not the kind of love this person has. So that's the test of true love. If the person allows you to make the choices you want to do without actually... And, and, and you could do many bad things in that place and they will still love you. They might not stay with you. Does that make sense? They might not put themselves in your company so they don't share in your bad things that you choose to do, but they will still love you. You can go to them at any time and they'll give you a hug and say, I'm glad to see you. They won't go, don't you come back here, you know, you did that to me or you did this to me. They won't do any of that. Because if you truly love a person, you don't try to control their will. Yeah? Now, these spirits are not like that. They are the other type of people. The other type of people are the type of people who claim to love, 
while at the same time trying to manipulate, control, and so forth. Right? That's what they are like. That's what these people are like. And easy, it's an easy way to test them. All you've got to do is disagree with them and see how they respond to your disagreement. Does that make sense? Now, it doesn't mean you have to yell at them. You just disagree with them and they'll be yelling at you. They'll be upset with you, generally. These are very good questions, by the way. Ladies have asked. Um, these are, it, this is how dark uh, manipulation gets through some unhealed emotions. And, and unfortunately, there are many billions of people on this planet who are manipulated in these ways. Yeah, billions of people. Yeah. Um, can this happen in our sleep state as well? Of without course it can happen in our sleep state. Being yes. a, without happen here? Yes. In the awake state? So in our awake state, we could have a huge emotion. So let's say this same person in their awake state has a huge emotion is of being afraid of others' opinions. Of them. So this person has a, a deep fear of other people's opinions of them. It's highly likely she will not engage in any activity that would cause any person on earth to feel any level of projection of shame. You, are, you should be ashamed of yourself or any of those kind of emotions. Does that make sense? So she would avoid all actions on earth that cause her to become the subject matter of shame. You follow? However, when she passes, when she goes every night into the sleep state and into the spirit world, in the spirit world she is completely aware that every single person can see her exactly as she is. So will that emotion cause her to stop taking any action? Not anymore. And so a person in the sleep state, while that emotion controls them in the awake state, they may have a completely different emotion controlling them in their sleep state and therefore engage in actions in their sleep state that they have not engaged in their awake state. Does that make sense? Yeah? It's very possible. Yeah? Is that the back one? I would like to ask this question. Um, how do we know someone is our soulmate? Um, the fastest way to know? Yeah. <laughs> Just are we okay with that subject, by the way? Is everyone... Oh, is that about this subject? Well, can I answer this question and then we go to this other question, which is very important, uh, linked to this question. Yeah, but it's a very... It's linked to the subject of sexual things that go on on Earth as well. They're quite, quite a lot of things, so let's, ask, let's resolve this issue fully. Mine is... We get into the feelings. I can sense the feelings. I start to feel them. And yet, I get stopped from going there. And it's whether the spirits, whether it's an eleventh spirit or it's another spirit that's doing it, and I'm like, yeah, yeah I've got this feeling, and I'm sitting with the feeling, and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this has been going on for so this is quite a, a while. This is a spirit. So there might be a number of different spirits, right? Influencing ourselves. So this is us on earth. Yep. So what you're saying is that you get into an emotion, emotion starts yeah. flowing, and then all of a sudden it feels like you're stopped. Yeah. Right, okay. Well, firstly, nobody can stop us from feeling an emotion unless we have a hook into them. Mm -hmm. So what we've got to do is discover what's our hook into them. That's really difficult to discover that. In the it's moment not. that we stop, there is a feeling. Yeah. And usually the feeling is related to a fear of some kind, yes? There's a fear that comes up at some point. Mm. So you start feeling emotion, and then there's a feeling that shuts you down. That's the feeling this person is projecting at you. So then you've got to ask yourself, well, what am I hooked to? Why am I afraid? And you can often sense, like, is it a woman or is it a man? You know, who is it? Sometimes it can be your mother in the spirit world. You know, things like that. You know, somebody who's past who knows you saying, no, no, you don't have to go there. Don't go there. That's painful. Don't go there. Uh, because it's related to their pain, right? So, so what happens is that we feel some kind of feeling coming from them 
The key is to be sensitive to that emotion. So define that emotion that you're feeling. So what's the emotion you feel from them? And that's the point where I also get stopped from finding what that emotion is. And it's the same when I wake up from sleep day, I'm there going, oh, I feel. And then my brain just, I'll get different thoughts coming in. The brain is useless for this. Yeah. <laughs> now, all you need to do is this. Hold your hand just there in yeah. your diaphragm. Breathe by filling up your diaphragm first. So feel, breathe. By, this is very hard to do if you're not used to doing it. So that's the area that goes into the base of your tummy, in this area here. Mm -hmm. that, that's where you want to fill up first. And then fill up the rest of your chest. And then let it all go. Every time you do that, if you keep doing that, you actually reconnect with yourself first. Mm -hmm. You stay connected with yourself. To feel what you're feeling from another person, you must stay connected to yourself. And that's the problem with being in the body with me. That's the problem. And that's been the whole problem all my life. I've always been... Exactly. So what I would suggest you do is a series of things to keep you in your own body. I do the connected breathing. I've learned how to go to the breathing. I do plus and yoga, but I, can still, I still can escape. <coughs> in well, those then I'll moments. be looking at why do you want to escape? escape? Yeah. Why? You you only go out of your body for your own reasons. Yeah. Nobody else causes you to go away from yourself. Why do you do it? You need to answer that question for yourself. Yeah. And even if somebody tells you why. It doesn't necessarily help until you discover why emotionally. Yeah. You need to discover the answer to that question. So what I would do is I'd pray to God about giving you the answer to the question as to why you go out of body all the time. No, I don't have well, I've had issues. I don't like being in the body. Being human is what I... So that these are starting to yeah. actually examine the reasons. Why don't you like being in the body? It's not comfortable. Why? Painful. Where is it painful? Can you see how I'm just yeah. asking the question? You give an answer, write yeah. down the answer. You can do this yourself. You write yeah. down the answer. Why? <laughs> you know, write down the next answer. Why? Write down the next answer. This is what I do for myself. Yeah. You know, until I get to the basis of it. But if you pray, what happens and set your intention to know, what happens is God... Through the help of all these helping spirits, your guides and your guardians and all these different ones, creates a circumstance in your life to expose why. Mm -hmm. And all you've got to do is observe it. Yeah, I had a big thing the other night with my brother. Well, I had a big argument and I stood there and I went, just feel, don't project. And I projected and the anger over everything. I just, yeah. it all come out. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you pray through those kind of events, you'll soon see why you don't want to stay in your body. Mm -hmm. That causes this problem where you're not sensitive to what's coming at you. Mm -hmm. And and when you're not sensitive, and, and I suggest to you one of the reasons why you go out of your body is because of what's coming at you yeah. that you don't want to feel. Yeah. So. Yeah, I sort of sense it, but it's like it, I can't actually feel it, I get the sense and it, and it's gone in an instant, it's so fast sometimes. So, so pray for a desire to feel it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So everything begins with our progress with with a desire. Without a desire for God we're never going to get to God. Without mm. a desire for ourselves we're never going to understand ourselves. Without a desire to <coughs> feel our soulmate we're never going to be with our soulmate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's all to do with desire. Okay, so that brings me to that soulmate question, because I think it would be a good question to finish off on, don't you think? Which is one? A, uh, not that one, to do with, um, do you, guides and guardian, do you have the same ones as your soulmate? Uh, no, but you can have, Right. but not always, yeah, okay. yeah you can have. I answered all most questions about soulmate last talk that I gave about guards and guardians, sorry. Yeah. Soulmate? Is it soulmate? Yeah. We're delaying this soulmate discussion. <laughs> Why is that? I have one question. I'm sure everyone has one question that really relates to 
Can I ask it? Yeah, quickly? you can ask Sorry. it. Sorry. <laughs> um, what What do you think is a deja vu? Do you have what? Um, I've answered that question okay. in a couple of recent talks, actually. Um, Could you tell me which ones? My yeah, entire the ones life that I gave like in the uh, middle Sweden. talk in Sweden. Oh, really? Is it in one? Okay. The second talk in Sweden. Yeah, yeah. So I've answered those questions. I've answered them a number of other times too in other talks. Okay, can I answer this Sonic question? Because I, I, while I've answered it before, there is a discussion in, uh, on the YouTube which is about soulmates. And there's a number of discussions specifically about soulmates and how we attract their soulmate. But I'd like to give you a summary of how. Does that make sense? So remember, your soulmate is the other half of yourself. Not many people on Earth grasp what that means. So one of the ways that you're going to be able to engage your soulmate is engage yourself. Now how do you engage yourself? You do that by feeling your own emotions. You do that by following your own desires. Right? You do that by satisfying your own longings that are harmonious with love. You do that by recognising the truth about yourself. That's a pretty big one. Can you see? That's a pretty one to engage yourself. You see, most people have a longing for their soulmate and at the same time have no desire to know themselves. And you know why? Because most of the time they want their soulmate to know them. <laughs> Do you see? They want their soulmate to give them the emotions that they are not willing to give themselves. You can't find your soulmate like that. You see, you have to engage yourself fully in order to draw your soulmate into your life. Because when you engage yourself and honour yourself and love, this is all about loving yourself. So let's put in brackets there, it's really loving yourself to do these things. When you love yourself, your soulmate is automatically feeling love from you. Do you understand that? They can automatically feel love from you because they are the other half of yourself. So they are automatically going to feel love from you. Number two. Heal intergender emotional injuries. And I would put in there and <coughs> and, and intergender false beliefs. All men are bastards. That's an intergender emotional false belief. Do you understand? If you don't heal that, how do you, if your soulmate's a male, how are you ever going to attract him? He's going to feel from you straight away he's a bastard before the whole relationship begins. He might not be, but he's going to feel that. Does that make sense, Sarah? Yeah? Question? Yes? Yeah. Just wait for Mike to wander down. He's locked himself up. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, will my soulmate be the one that triggers all my fears and all my issues? And um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, your soulmate could trigger all of those things, yeah. certainly. But, but it, if your soulmate does trigger all of these things, it's often because your soulmate has an opposite set of injuries that you have. 
So it just depends on what injuries your soulmate has as to what injuries you have. It's possible also that your soulmate has a whole set of similar injuries to you and therefore will not trigger many of these things. Does that make sense? So it just depends on what kind of emotional injuries your soulmate has absorbed from his or her experience. Yeah? And so how do we heal the emotional injuries? Basically the process that you said before. Feel it, release it, pray to God, show me the truth. <laughs> well, yeah, we have to start first with humility, don't we? Okay. Yeah. What's humility again? It's a passionate desire to feel everything within ourselves and be open to new beliefs and, and open to the experience of feeling our own emotions. Right? So we need humility to do that. We also need truth, don't we? Like, if I believe all men are bastards, and I, and I can cry about that as far as, as far as I want, but until I re receive the truth, which is all men are not bastards, actually, um, until I receive that truth, I'm not going to be healed on that particular emotion. Right? So I have to be, have a willingness to accept the truth on a particular subject as well. And once I do that, I also, obviously, as I receive love from God, when I notice myself not receiving love from God, then I know I'm out of harmony with love in some way, or I'm out of harmony with truth in some way, or I'm not being humble. So that tells me that I'm resistive. So look at all my resistances. I need to examine when I'm resistive and see it for what it is. Yeah? That's a very important process. So all the basics of spirituality will actually help us through that process. But can you see how the intergender emotional injuries in particular are going to affect my relationship with my soulmate? Whether my soulmate is of the same gender as me or not. So when I say of the same gender or not, like let's say my soulmate is male and I'm a male. Right? If that is the case, I still need to heal intergender emotional injuries. Because, for example, many male homosexuals project sexually at women. And the reason why they do it is they have damaged relationships with their mothers that they need to heal. Now, projecting sexually at a person is damaging the soulmate relationship if the person's not your soulmate. And so, of course, it's going to interfere with the two of you coming together. So it has to be both sets of genders. The male and the female gender injuries need to be released. As you release it, you'll get closer and closer to your soulmate. And there'll come a point where you're where you've released enough to attract your soulmate into your life, and many of you may not recognise them instantly. We've seen many people in the same vicinity of their soulmate for four years, five years, and they don't know that they're soulmates yet because they have these two things not happening still. Yeah? And so they can't engage themselves and they don't recognise and so forth. Okay? Is there any more that we can think of? Engage yourself. Heal your own intergender emotional injuries. So you understand what I mean by that? That one? You're okay with that, my answer so far that I'm giving you? I'm open. You're open, no worries. <laughs> okay. Third thing. Allow yourself To feel your actual feelings towards your other half, your soulmate, your soulmate. Every single person on this planet has a set of actual feelings about soulmates. By the way, many times it's very negative feelings. For example, many people do not want there to be a soulmate. Because many of us have grown up with the theory of there's lots of different people for you. Now, why do we grow up with that? Because it makes us feel nice and secure that we don't have to find one. Now, many of us also have feelings like, if there's one person for me, how the hell do I ever find them? I'll be alone for the rest of my life. There's an actual feeling about my soulmate. If I don't find my soulmate, I'll be alone for the rest of my life. A feeling about my soulmate. So you need to allow yourselves to feel your actual feelings about your soulmate. What they really are, not what you hope they are. 
Do you understand the difference? What they really are, rather than what you hope they are. See, oftentimes you hope that you feel nice feelings towards your soulmates, but the reality is you're feeling like, I badly need my soulmate to come along and save me from my life. That might be the actual feeling, right? Now, you imagine a soulmate on the other end of that feeling. They're going, no, I'm not coming to her life. She wants me to come and fix up her life. I want her to fix up her life first before I go to her. You see? The soulmate's got a role before he even meets you or she meets you. Not very pleasant. Every time you've ever been placed in a role that you had predefined for you before you've even decided for yourself, how did it feel for you? Not very pleasant. Right? So this is where we need to feel our actual feelings towards our soulmate, not the ones we imagine we have or that we hope we have. Do you understand the difference? Many times we have a lot of hopeful emotions about our soulmate, while at the same time having quite other different soul, uh, emotions. Many of us have a strong neediness coming out of us, a need for another person to come and solve the problems of my life, a need for another person to come and love me, a need for another person to come and appreciate how good I am, a need for another person to come and make me feel nice feelings about myself. And I put to you that while all of those needs are present, we are rejecting, actually pushing away our soulmate. Because if you imagine that you're, for instance, having a feeling, appreciate me, what, that's a demand being placed upon your mate, your other half of you, to appreciate you. Is that loving, to have a demand going to another person? No. So you see, when I'm in a true state of love with my soulmate, whether I've met them yet or not, I will actually want to give them the gift of my love. And I will be totally okay with not receiving any love from them. Right? In other words, you'd be okay with meeting them and them rejecting you. Now, most people, when they meet their soulmate and the soulmate rejects them, they for the next 20 years, are up in arms about it, right? So in other words, they didn't have an emotion of love towards their soulmate. They had an emotion of demand coming out of them towards their soulmate. So you've got to allow yourself to feel your true feelings, your actual feelings towards your soulmate. This, is, this gets back to this one, doesn't it? To do that, we've got to be humble enough to recognise what our actual feelings are towards the person we want as a, the person we want to meet, who we, who we believe right, is our soulmate. But can you see that if we do not engage ourselves, passionately engage ourselves and our desires and our passions and our longings, how can we ever expect our soulmate to actually enjoy us? We can't really, can we? Because we don't even know ourselves. Right? So a key thing is going to be allowing ourselves to know ourselves, knowing, allow me to know me. And, and if I engage that process completely, you will very rapidly catch up with your soulmate. Because what happens in, in, from a law of attraction perspective is your soulmate is the most sensitive emotionally than any other person on this planet or any other person in the spirit world to your emotions. Your soulmate, being the other half of you, is the most sensitive to every one of your emotions. So if you have an emotion towards ang of anger towards a male, and your soulmate's a male, what's, your soulmate is the person feeling that emotion the most. Does that make sense to everyone? You, the soulmate, because it's the other half of you, has the most emotional openness to all of your beliefs, and all of your emotions and all of your feelings about both genders, about yourself, everything. Your soulmate is the most sensitive to you. God created them as the most sensitive to you. Later on, in the, in when you meet them and, and deal with some of the injuries, you will actually enjoy them being the most sensitive to you and you the most sensitive to them. But while we've got different injuries towards the opposite gender or the same gender as ourselves, our soulmates feeling that the most sensitively. They are the most sensitive to that feeling. 
those feelings. Does that make sense to everybody? So unless I deal with those feelings, I might meet other men, but I'm not yet ready to meet my soulmate. Yeah? And uh, once I feel those feelings, then I'll rapidly meet my soulmate. And it doesn't matter where your soulmate is in the world. Has no, doesn't matter at all. Because the law of attraction between soulmate halves is the strongest law of attraction on the planet. All right? so when you engage it, it's the strongest law of attraction. You will pull them into your life. You won't have to try to pull them into your life. If you do these things, it will automatically happen. Yeah? What if you think you know who your soulmate is, you went out with them like 20 years ago, yep. a big cosmic experience, you know that that's your soulmate, right? Yep. Many people do, by the way. Right. Yep. But like, you know, time has gone He's past. married now, I've got three kids. <laughs> <laughs> married but, to somebody else right <laughs> no, got divorced already yeah. and um, what if what if they're in a state and like you've kind of like taken a different path from them in their life and like say you know who your soulmate is and you love them and they're an alcoholic and they're a mess mm -hmm. and you know where they are and you're kind of you're like on this spiritual path and you're like okay so what do I do now? Like, do I have to go back to that person and try and sort them out? It's like you said, you know, it's like if you have a job to do, it's like, Jesus, if I go back to my soulmate, I have to, like, get them off alcohol, I have to do this, da, da, da. Or, or it's like, or is it someone else? <laughs> You're too drunk to write. I don't even know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It's got an H involved. See? What's your judgments about an alcoholic? Well, he's a mess. <laughs> so you've now told me he's an alcoholic, he's a mess. Yeah, keep going. Tell me all these judgments you have. <laughs> um... She's not on, he's not on the spirit. You, you, yeah, he you. used to be really spiritual and really cosmic and really wise, and stuff happened to him, and he's just lost. Like, they're all, I don't even know if that spirit is even in there anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, so can I write down some emotions you're feeling towards your soulmate? Condescension is one of them. <laughs> right. Yeah, what else is there that you feel towards him? Um, sadness. I, I feel sad. It's not I, sadness towards him, though, because if it was sadness towards him, it would be compassion, but you don't really feel compassion. No, I do kind of feel compassion, too. Well, no, you ca you're calling him a mess. In a really loving way. <laughs> <laughs> I still love him and talk to him every day. <laughs> Self honesty. <laughs> Keep going with yourself, honestly. I like it. I, I, I do still love him. We do talk a lot. And I really, I, I would love to, I, I feel sad because I don't want to see him like that because he's, he's really wise. Okay, why don't you want to see him like this? Be because he's actually got a really amazing, cosmic, pure, enlightened spirit, or at least he did once. So Pretty you see dark. him as being degraded from his good condition? Yeah. So I've bashed him around. But I'm wondering that if I sorted myself out spiritually, whether he would spontaneously give up alcohol. I think that quickly, a lot. <laughs> what do you feel about men? About men? About men. Um, Just generally. Generally? Yeah. I, I like them. They're strong. Ah, so you need them to be strong? <laughs> <laughs> I, I get on pretty well with men. I, I got a lot of male friends, actually. Right, so you don't really need him, do you? <laughs> well, he was the best one. Oh, he's the best one. <laughs> so you don't think he's the best one. He's a mess and he's Oh, no, he's not anymore. <laughs> but can you see all these emotions are going towards him? Every emotion you feel is going towards him. Right. right so what, what's caused his sadness? Do you know what caused his sadness? See, sadness is the cause of alcoholism, so what caused his sadness? What caused his sadness? Yeah. Um... I think an outcome went wrong at one point. You think. 
Well, yeah, no, an outcome went wrong. At one point, um, we took wrong turns in life. Can, um, you, can you say you don't know? No, I, no, you... I do know. No, he, he went out with... Um, he left me for a crazy woman and had a child and then she How screwed his head up and, well, she was pretty crazy. How she, did you feel about it? What? How did you feel about him leaving you for a crazy woman? Well, obviously I was pretty gutted. No, but no look, how did you feel? Gutted is like, uh, like there is a gutter outside. <laughs> <laughs> What's the feeling? I was upset. How upset? Really upset. What it, describe the upset. Um, you were knives so in my heart being, upset. Yeah, but you're so resisted to being honest about it. So let's be really honest and frank about it. How upset? I was really upset. You were in <laughs> a... What were you in? In a mess. A mess? <laughs> <laughs> the first mess idea is uh, emotions. Yeah. What is your emotion? Anger. Rage. Upset. No, no, it's not anger or rage. It's it's real chronic sadness. No, no, it's not sadness either. What what's like that sharp version of sadness? <laughs> you do not want to accept some things here. You have a lot of unresolved emotions towards him about him leaving you. Right? You have a lot of unresolved emotions about what you believe is his stupidity in the actions that he took. You feel he was a stupid idiot taking the actions he took. Right? There are a lot of these kind of emotions that you don't want to feel because you believe it's unspiritual to feel them. While you believe it's not spiritual to feel them, you're not going to feel them. But you need to feel them to resolve the issue between him and you. Now, his sadness is caused by rejection by females, is it not? And, and his own failure. No, isn't that your definition of what he sees as his own failure? Like, see, this is where, if I was truly interested in my soulmate in this circumstance, I would be looking very strongly at not my definition of his problems, but his definition of his problems. And I would encourage him to, dis to, to go down the track of discovering why he's so sad that causes him to turn to alcoholism. He's avoiding his own sadness and it causes him to turn to alcoholism. I would, look, I would help him go through the process of, of discovering why. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Why he's so sad. But you are very resistive to seeing any of your own emotions in play. And really? this is, yeah, you're very resistive to it. Because you don't want to state what the actual emotions are. You want them to be embellished enough so that you don't see the pure rage of some of them. Do you understand? Okay. We, many of us do this, and it's, and it's great that you've asked the question. I'm not judging at all. I'm just saying it's great that you've asked the question because what we do is we try to make ourselves believe we have different emotions than what we really have. I, I put to you, if you have felt all of your emotions regarding this man to the degree necessary, he would already be with you and he would no longer be an alcoholic. Right, so it's, it's interesting because I was actually doing this Last night and this morning, mm -hmm. I was releasing, I was like crying a lot. And I was like, why am I crying? Why am I crying? And, and I realized that it was old stuff about, about this guy. And I was like, okay, I need to release this. I need to heal this. Mm -hmm. I agree. And like, so it's got me thinking during your talk. I'm like thinking, oh, yeah, what about, you know, yep. that I guy? <laughs> but it's very important for you to have more self-honesty about okay. the real emotions that are present. The real emotions that were present at the time that you suppressed that are related not to him but to your father. That's a bit of a left field one. The real emotions you have about yourself related well, to your no, mother. That's, that's all tied in because dad died at the same time that he left. So, <laughs> so I was crying about both of them. It's all kind of simultaneously ma mashed up in so the same dad time. dad dies... This is very interesting. Dad dies and your partner leaves. Uh -huh. And how many days were there between these events? Um, about a month. One month? Yeah. He was with you. When Dad died, he left. Is that no, the other way around. The other way around. He left. Partner leaves one month before Dad dies. Yeah. Is that how it happened? Yeah. Okay. That 
tells me I have a lot of unresolved emotions with males. I've had two primary males in my life leave me. There's a lot of unresolved emotions in that. Right. So yeah. that has to be in your soul towards males. Does that make sense? Oh, right. The, what, the sadness of loss. It's like for that's two, what I brought to work on. Yeah, yeah. For two men to leave you within the course of a month who are your primary men in your life, mm -hmm. there has to be a lot of sadness towards the male needed to be addressed. Okay. Otherwise, yeah. these events wouldn't have happened so close together to trigger the emotion that you actually need to feel. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's totally true. I'm looking at that right now, like years later. I'm like, oh, have I got unprocessed stuff around that? that I need Certainly. To... So what was your level of, tra of attachment to your father? Oh, he was awesome. I love him to bits. Mm -hmm. But he's in the spirit world now, and he's around me nearly every day right now. Your father was your soulmate substitute. An, emo an emotion that he created in you, not you. He's more like a guide. More like a... Like a guide. He's like a wise I old gander. I because I can feel him right now. He's certainly not your guide. <laughs> He's okay. certainly not guiding you. He's heavily influencing your life in a manner that is codependent and you don't want to give him up because you don't want to grieve it. And while you don't give up your dad, you're never going to be able to engage fully with a partner. Many people do not realise this. If you cannot give up your mother, emotionally give up your mother as a, as a primary relationship, you're not going to ever connect with any woman, if you're a male, with any person who's your soulmate who's a woman because your primary relationship is your mother. Your primary relationship is still your father, even though he's in the spirit world. But he would try and help me to get the soulmate guy because he knew that he was my soulmate and he would try and help me. <laughs> But the question is, why do I need his help to find my soulmate? Okay. What does, you see, there has to be some codependency. Kind of there. But there's also a lot of grief because two men, primary men in your life, left you within a month apart. There's got to be something there. Uh -huh. It's got to be either related to your mum's opinion of men or your own, or your own treatment that you've had from your own father. Okay, so, so it's an unresolved sadness of loss, and I need to... How can I heal? Well, what now can I do? you're intellectualising the process, <laughs> and I don't want to go any further with it because of that. Because you're not letting yourself feel. See, see in the beginning of this discussion, you asked me, what's blocking me from my soulmate? I'm saying to you, what's blocking you from your soulmate is a heap of unresolved emotions towards your soulmate that you won't even admit to yourself that you have. I'm, I'm willing to admit all the emotions. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not. And that's okay to admit that, but you need to first admit it before you'll see what emotions you're avoiding. What, what, do, you, what do you think I'm avoiding? What, what you're avoiding you rage. Okay. Right. How did you feel when Dad died? Actually, I have got a, a huge amount of anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I used you're... to try and channel it positively. Exactly. There's no such thing. <laughs> no um, yeah, yeah, it, I, yeah. I've got a massive amount of anger. Yeah, and you need to feel it rather than trying to challenge, you know, channel it positively. So, what is the rage about? It's about what did you lose when Dad died? Can I can I list some of the things you lost? You lost the only person. who validates you as a woman. The only person who approves of you. The only person who accepted you. This is quite a lot to lose <laughs> in one person. Right? And of course, there's an addiction to each of those things because rage or anger is caused by the addiction not being met. So do you understand that, that principle? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The only reason why we would get angry is because the addiction won't be met. So, so there's an addiction to those things created by the relationship with your father. Your father <coughs> in the spirit world is still trying to satisfy these addictions in you. Right now, right now he's with you satisfying those addictions. 
-hmm. While he is meeting these addictions in you, you don't have to feel the opposite emotion. Do you understand? Okay. It is all about self-reliance for sure. It, it does come back to that. My soulmate used to teach me that. He, he used to teach me that if I loved myself with no need, then he would, he would be there. And if but I had any... Also, he would also... Um, the, the reality is while you're trying to get these emotions fulfilled by your father, uh -huh. you're certainly not going to connect with your soulmate on the same level. Because your father's satisfying them. Right. And this is what I'm talking about with your connection with your father. Many women have this strong bond with their fathers and they can't bond to any other male while their bond with their father remains in this manner. Do you see? Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and you can only deal with that by releasing some of these things. Now, your rage at your father's death demonstrates that you were addicted to him in some ways and these are some of the addictions. Uh -huh. right? And you don't want to feel them as addictions. You want to feel them as rights. You feel them as rights, yeah. as justifiable. Right? But unfortunately, your father is now coming along in spirit world attempting to satisfy these addictions. Why do you think your soulmate left one month after? Sorry, your soulmate left one month before your father passed. Is that... Was it yeah. Your father yeah. passed first or... Um, yeah, no, no, he left first. So I may left first. Mm -hmm. okay. Why do you feel he left? Yeah. <laughs> um, the whole thing felt like a spiritual test. It felt like the most spiritually challenging. God never year. tests you with anything. <laughs> it felt like if I could rise to a certain level spiritually, um, then my soulmate would return. And I think my dad said that to me before he died. Um, I agree with the theory behind that, perhaps, but it's a great way of avoiding a whole series of emotions. Yeah. So what are the feelings you have? You notice every time I ask you what the feelings are, you keep avoiding the question. Do I? Yeah. Does, it, does she not? Yes. Yes. Really? Yes. Okay. So, so, so. <laughs> My first focus would be, if I was you, rather than worrying about any more of this, is how much do I really want self-honesty about my feelings? Because it feels to me that while you convince yourself that you do, you don't really. I'm really no, I'm really up for the work. I've been, I've been doing that the last... Your actions in our discussion prove that you're not. Is my head getting in the way? It of doesn't... course your head's getting in the way, but there's always a reason why. <laughs> <laughs> So, what, so perhaps the best thing to do in answer of your question is to look, talk and pray with God about this <laughs> desire to know what you truly feel with regard to your father and your ex-partner, who you feel is your soulmate, rather than what you believe you feel. Because mm -hmm. what you believe you'll feel is preventing him from being with you. Okay. So I try and go false. what what I really feel about him and then release those feelings. Yes, but you're going to have to be a lot more honest with yourself than you're currently being to okay. do that. And, and what you're seeing that you think I'm not seeing is a lot of anger? Yes, but there's a lot of addiction. There's a lot of the male must provide these certain roles to me. Ah, right. And if he doesn't provide those roles, he's not in my life. So it does come back to self-reliance. What, what I asked earlier about, it seems to me like a lot of problems in life are sorted out by having your own connection to source and not needing that from your partner. Right? Yeah, I don't call that self-reliance. I call that God-reliance right. and self-responsibility. In other words, I don't place the responsibility for somebody else to make me feel something on somebody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I either feel it or I don't feel it. If I don't feel it, I need to heal it. Mm. Yeah, towards myself. That's self-responsibility. If I'm God-reliant, I'll be able to see those things quite easily and also engage self-responsibility. That's not the same as self-reliance. Self-reliance is where I believe what I believe, immaterial of what's true or not, and immaterial of what God believes about the situation or not. That's mm -hmm. self-reliance. 
and self-reliance is not going to help you because you've been self-reliant for a long time <laughs> and it's not helping you draw your soulmate back into your life, you understand? Right. Yeah. So, so there is a need for God-reliance and self-responsibility and self-honesty. Really being honest about your true feelings that you have towards males and your true demands that you have going out of yourself towards men rather than what you believe is a right. At the moment, you'd be good to write down all of what you believe are your rights <laughs> and see them instead of rights as demands. Okay. They are demands coming out of you. Every time you demand something of another person, you are repelling them. Mm. They have a role, you're repelling them every single time. So, and, and this, this whole idea of rights, many, many women who talk to me about soulmates have a huge issue with this. All right? They ask me, why isn't my soulmate with me? I've been alone now six years, why isn't it with me? Because you believe you should be with you. You believe that you have the right for, you know, to demand this of him. You've got all these demands coming out of you towards, to, towards men generally and towards him specifically. And of course he doesn't want to fulfil them all. all right? Because that's not love. Love is a gift that you give to the other person. Mm -hmm. all right? And while we intellectually go, yes, I know love is a gift, emotionally most of us have. Love is a barter system. <laughs> is what we really believe. Right? What we really believe inside of our hearts, even though we say, yeah, we know love is a gift, we go, no, 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 love is a bartering system. That's what we believe love to be. Bartering system means he'll give me some things, I'll give him some things, we'll have a great time. <laughs> That's not love. That's called codependence. It's not the same thing. And the believing you have rights, particularly with your soulmate, is one major way to repel him. It is funny, but when I was having a relationship with my soulmate, it was really evolved, and he used to teach me exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. he, he was like, no, no, you've got to be dependent on yourself, you make yourself happy, and then you can hold the vibration, and then you can connect in that, in that yeah. really pure high vibration. The fact that he is now an alcoholic, though, means that he himself did not necessarily believe his own words to you, Yeah, he... which is an issue in itself, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. So does that help you with the soulmate discussion? <laughs> yeah, it's there's a lot to look at. That's great. It's like they just know. This is the answer. Sorry? You just know that somebody is your soulmate. No, I've seen many people walk straight past them in the street. I've seen many people in the spirit world go, be introduced to me, Todd, this is your soulmate. They look at the soulmate and they go, no, he isn't. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> you don't just know. And the reason why you don't just know is because of all of those reasons I listed. If you don't address knowing yourself and you don't address your own gender emotional addictions, then you're not going to know. You're going to meet them, walk straight past them and not even engage them. In fact, many of you will meet them and hate their guts <laughs> because of the addictions that you have and they have and they trigger in you. And the reality is you don't just know, particularly the first time you meet. Particularly the first time you meet. When I say the first time you meet, um, if you ever do get to the union state and come back, then there'll be a second time you meet. But until that point, it would be the first time you meet. And for most people, they very rarely recognise their soulmates because of all of the different emotions and addictions in place. They can walk straight past them. They can, they, they can grow up with them in the same town, in the same school, in the same life and still not recognise them. That's the sad thing. And the only reason why they don't, of course, is because of those things that I listed. So don't assume that you'll just meet them and know, because it's not true. Yeah, just not true. Even if you are with your soulmate, you still need to do all of these things there. To join. To join. Exactly. So, so even if the person you're with right now is your soulmate, you won't have a soulmate relationship until you address those issues anyway. So you will feel a relationship with them, but it won't be a strong soulmate relationship um, because, because of the different emotional injuries and so forth that we've had. Yeah. Okay. Very good question. Okay, well, um, I think uh, we've discussed some of the earth change questions that you wanted to ask Peter, haven't you? And so we don't really need to discuss them now. Yeah, that's fine. So um, what I would like to do is take this opportunity, we've only got 40, 30 minutes or 40 minutes now to pack up and everything. 
what I'd like to do is thank, thank you very much for your time coming and, uh, and introducing yourself to us. For many of you, we've met you for the first time. And uh, for those of you who have seen a few times, it's been good to see you again. Uh, we're heading home to Australia tomorrow, so uh, we don't know when we will see you again. So we hope and pray that you continue to embrace your own desires and your own passions and continue to embrace this desire or develop a desire for God to grow towards God and develop a desire to, to, to follow your own passions and desires rather than following what other people tell you to do. And we'd just love to hear from you about what happens with those kind of desires and passions. And we're headed back, as I said, uh, tomorrow to Australia. We'll be there in two or three days' time. And, uh, and we would like... Um, there are now you've been recorded on the audience, which other people will see. Uh, many of you will have watched different videos of the people in Australia asking questions. And uh, those same people have asked me to give to you their love uh, because they, they think of you uh, as well. So we'd like to pass that on to you, their, their, their love for you. And uh, would you like to thank them for their bravery to ask the questions they have asked and to be put on YouTube and so forth? Uh, would you like to thank them for that? Yeah. Yeah. And we'd like to thank Mike and Fee as well for putting us up for a few days every time we come back. Mike's been having very many early mornings taking us to the airport and so forth, so we'd like to thank him for that. And we'd like to also encourage you as a group to consider um, meeting in, a, in, in a, at least some kind of fashion to, to think about and talk about the issues of divine truth. And we've talked to Mike and Fee about some of the things that could be done you know, in a group setting to do that. However, can I remind you of one or two things? If you come along to a, any group that is done without the desire for humility which would indicate, if by the way, that you would never get angry or in a rage. So no anger or no rage. If you have a desire for truth, you won't become offended at receiving it. You understand? And if you have a desire for love, you will always find yourself getting along with somebody. Yeah? My suggestion is if you do consider coming along to some kind of group together and having some kind of group together, that you remain very focused on these things. And what I've encouraged Mike and Fee to do is any person who demonstrates anger or taking of offence or resistance is just asked in that moment to leave. They can come back when they've calmed down. But in that moment they need to leave. If they come back and within a very short time get angry again about the same thing, then ask them to leave again. And if they come back the third time and they get very angry about the same thing, ask them to leave again. Until they learn that love should be the guiding force in our interactions with each other. Yeah? So I feel that if you can do that as a group together, You've plenty of you, if you wanted to get together on a fairly regular basis, looking at different things, but you are going to be, have to be very truthful with yourself. Don't worry about being truthful with other people very much. There is a strong need for each of us to learn how to be truthful with ourselves. Yeah? If you're really truthful with yourself you will, and stay in a state of humility, you won't get angry, you won't, get, you won't be nasty to another person, you won't attack them. You won't belittle them, you won't be condescending to them, you won't treat them badly, in other words. And that's what's needed. If, if there's going to be a group in any place that actually develops in love, there's going to need to be an absence of unloving emotions in the location. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to be perfect because we're all growing love, but we need to address it. We need to say, no, please go. When the person comes back, if they're still in the same state, no, please go. We need to be consistent with our feelings about those three primary truths. Remember at the beginning of our discussion, the first time I was here, I said that these qualities are the mark of true spirituality. This, this tells you, these three qualities tell you whether you're developed in love or not. 
if you have those qualities. They tell you whether you're truly changing in a spiritual manner towards God and towards your neighbour. These tell you the truth about yourself. If you can't maintain those three qualities, then be honest about it and address the emotions that, that are there. Pseudo-spirituality has no place in divine truth where we all make out that everything's friendly and then go away and bicker behind each other's back. That is pseudo-spirituality. It has no place in, in love and truthful, in a truthful and loving environment. So I'd encourage each of you, if you are going to embrace something like that, and I think, Mike, um, you want me to put your email address? Your yeah, e if people want to uh, email me, let me know their interest. I'm teaching comms at the moment for baseball and I'm just going to be... So if you, if you want to know what dates are organised and where it is to have yeah, a... If someone's interested in meeting up, if they email me just say I'm interested, then we can work from there. I can't leave the email at the moment. So what is it, Oyster? Futures. Futures. I think it's on the website, isn't it? Yeah, it should be on the website. At gmail.com. So that's for <laughs> stuff that happens to you in the UK. Is that and no, that's his email address. Email. Our website, by the way, is just www.divinetruth. Com. And some of the things we've got planned for the future include Mary's going to do a bit of a book club type thing where a group gets together, reads a part of a book that's a spiritually related book and discuss it and we're going to record that and put it on YouTube so there's things that you can keep up with on YouTube. The YouTube site uh, that we've got most of our gear on at the moment is a friend of ours. Uh, it's called Wizard Shack. Or you can search for Divine Truth Channel as separate words. And myself and Mary, we do not have an email uh, address list. We don't maintain an email list anymore. We used to years ago, but about three or four years ago we stopped doing that. And the reason why we stopped doing that is it just takes a long time, a lot of time and and in the end, everyone starts complaining when they don't receive when they receive emails that they um, didn't want and things like that. So we don't do any of that. Whatever we are going to do, we finish up putting on the internet, on the website, on the Divine Truth website, not the Divine Truth channel, but the DivineTruth.com website. So if you want to know where we are at any time in terms of different venues or different things that are happening or so forth, we usually try to keep that updated. Um, but it's only me who updates that at this point. So, so sometimes it gets a bit neglected. But uh, that's where we keep people informed about what's happening. So to know what's happening, you'll have to actually go to the site and see on what's new. There's a page called What's New, and you'll see what's happening there um, if you want to know what's going on. We don't have any other way that we communicate with people regularly aside from via the website and through different things that we organise. There is also an organisation that we've begun called, in the, called, and there's a website for that as well, but this one's even worse in the sense of how it's uh, kept up to date. It's called God's Way of Love. org, And it's a, a website that eventually we hope to have somebody maintaining and keeping you abreast with all the different things that are happening with the God's Way of Love organisation, which is an organisation which you can download the constitution of from the website that describes a whole mm -hmm. lot of things that myself and Mary do and many others do voluntarily in Australia at the moment, but it can be around the world on all different sorts of areas of endeavour, all, all different scientific, mathematical, as well as, uh, I suppose you'd call it, to humanities and other areas of endeavour. And on that website, is a, it's, it's, it's begun to be created. It's not completely formatted there. So there are the contact details uh, for, for letting you know what we're doing around the world, basically. We're hoping to see um, 
different uh, centres set up around the world where people want to practice the principles of divine truth and they set up a centre not for the sake of having a community in the sense of a community living, but rather it will be a learning centre, a centre of learning. And uh, at this stage we've got two of those centres in Australia that are being set up uh, as we speak. And then there's a third uh, couple in Sweden who wants to set up a, uh, one of these centres in Sweden. But we only set up the centres where we believe there will be some kind of long-term, um, some kind of long-term um, survivability of that centre. Um, and we do not feel that England is one of those places that will have long-term survivability of a centre. So we won't support the setting up of one in England. You want to know why? <laughs> yeah. Because we don't feel England will survive earth changes. Well, we would encourage all of you to feel about your desires firstly, because it's your desires that will probably determine what you want to do with the rest of your life, including whether you want to live or, or pass as well. That's all about desires. So I would, I would just firstly ask myself the question about desires. We've talked to Mike and Fee and to um, Angela and Peter a little about where we feel there are safe places in Europe to exist. But there are plenty of safe places in the world, so if you follow your desires, I'm sure you'll end up with one of them in one of those locations. And we just feel that it's not, not good to set up or invest a lot of our time or effort in a place where um, there is the potential of, uh, of, of all of that effort being lost. Does that make sense? Yeah. So. Now, having an earth change discussion is a, is a completely different kettle of fish and would take a lot longer than the few minutes that we've got left, so um, I can't engage that discussion now, but I'm sure you will hear over the coming months where we feel are safe places around the earth and so forth. You don't have to agree with us, and, um, and my feelings are don't go and do something out of fear anyway. Always make sure you personally feel the need to do something before you embrace it. So do not trust me for whatever reason, other than that you believe it to be true. Does that make sense? So don't, don't go and do things just because I'm saying certain things without you really feeling them as being true. Yeah. Ooh, the mood went down there really rapidly. Stop living by all the <laughs> Bluntly, yes, all of those areas will have a difficulty. Uh, I'm talking about human survivability in a, to, a, to a relatively basic comfort level. Yeah. So there may be certain people who do survive in those regions at different places, but it would be very intensely difficult to survive in those regions. So I'm not saying that it's not survivable. I'm saying whether you, you will have a degree of comfort in doing so, and I don't think so. And the time scale. <laughs> um, it's a changing time scale because of the condition of the planet changing every moment. Every time our soul condition collectively changes, then the time scale of different events change, of course. So I can't give you time scale. What, what I would do instead is uh, point you in a certain direction, and that is this. There will be a, a gradual ramping up of events of a cataclysmic nature on Earth. Does that make sense? It'll start with quite minor events, right? Which I expect to happen in the next few months, which are which are similar in intensity and nature to the two thousand and three tsunamis that occurred in the in, in the Indian Ocean, um, which caused the death of nearly two hundred fifty thousand people. Right? These events will slowly there will be different ones rolling around different locations in the Earth, and this is an indication that the different plates of the earth are starting to free up to, 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 actually, uh, to actually start to, starting to move against each other. 
As the intensity of the events increase, this is a warning sign to every person on the planet that eventually there will be some very difficult cataclysmic events occur in different locations. My suggestion is to not wait until then until you do something. If these events don't occur, then you don't need to worry so much, right? But if these events occur, then you need to think about what I've said to you and then take some potential actions. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so what will happen is there will be a series of events which are seismic uh, in nature. So they will relate to volcanic activity, earthquake activity and so forth. And of course tsunamis that result from those kind of activity. All over the earth that, that are destabilising the earth's crust and it's co caused by some things happening to the core of the earth. The key is to allow yourself to observe these events and ask yourself whether they are increasing. The world around you and the media around you will tell you they are not related. Right? So you'll be told that they are not related to each other, that there'll be no scientific relationship between them, and there will be a scientific relationship to them that, that unfortunately the scientists, many of them, know about at this moment, but are being quietened about it. Or that the majority of those know about, but it would be too late then to, to make choices and decisions. Don't wait until things get really intense before you do anything. Allow yourself to see the ramping up of events and observe them. And if you observe them, then ask yourself, all right, how big does the next event have to be? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And uh, what I would be doing is I'd be making choices and decisions when I feel those events get to a point where I feel I need to move. Now, now that I've said that to you, your guides and your guardians are going to prompt you to notice certain things and to be aware of certain things around you. The key is to listen to their promptings, their role. Remember, right, a week or two weeks ago, we said their role is to guide you and help you and assist you through this process, yeah? So their role is to help protect your life and also help you engage your desires and passions. So there's no need to be afraid. You just need to notice the ramping up of these events. And listen to the guidance about doing something about them. But of course, if you don't worry about all of that at all, and instead you just engage your passions and desires in a loving manner, you'll find that it will have the same consequence. In the sense that you'll be led to the right location at the right time and you won't have to worry about what potential events might be. Does that make sense? Okay. We would like to thank you for your time and, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again at some point in the future. We're not sure when that will be. And, and, uh, and, but we do feel that for many of you, we'll definitely meet you in the future, so you don't need to worry uh, for those of you who are worried about that issue. And the, uh, we feel quite strongly that uh, we would love to try and assist as much as we can in your own spiritual development. But of course, two people are quite limited in terms of what we can do individually with each person. And if, if you could just bear that in mind, if you try to email us or something like that, it's not always easy for us to respond. And in fact, it's rare for myself now to respond to people's emails because there's just so many other things happening. And, I, and to be frank, I don't like sitting in front of a computer um, typing when I could be talking and covering the same material in a quarter of the time. You know? so, but we'd like to encourage you to continue in your desire for God and your desire for truth and your desire to become more loving people. And we'd just like to leave you with that thought. Thank you so much.